tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today's podcast is part two of a webinar that we did with the folks at Neighborhood Cats called Return to Field and Targeting, the Community Cat Program. I hope you were able to listen to part one last week, and this is part two, so hope you enjoy it. If you'd like to watch the video version, we have it at YouTube. We also will have a link in the show notes to access the handouts from the webinar on our website at communitycatspodcast.com. You also can watch the video there on the website. So enjoy. It's a great presentation, wonderful job, really valuable information, and we wanted to make sure we shared it on the podcast. So enjoy part two, Return to Field and Targeting, the Community Cat Program, presented by Neighborhood Cats. So what are, what are some of the other fears? And this is borne out now that you remember that first Jacksonville program was in 2008. So now we have 14 years of experience. And you're going to have people who are just really unhappy because the local shelter was kind of the dumping ground for them. You're going to have pest control agencies that are very unhappy because they were getting paid to trap the cats and then they make a windfall by dropping them off at your shelter and they don't incur any of the costs. Now, all of a sudden, they're out of business with a return to field program. So you will have unhappy people, but they will be very much the minority is what most shelters have experienced. So what are some of the other fears? Well, the people who brought the cats in really don't want them there. So when they come back, they're going to harm them. So this is certainly a genuine, you know, a legitimate risk to be concerned with. But there has not been any reports of return to field programs that have experienced a large widespread increase in animal abuse as a result of these programs. You know, most people are not going to commit a crime, are not going to resort to violence. Uh, That doesn't mean you shouldn't be very careful and screen your people when they come in and they drop cats off. And you may have, you know, somebody along the way who you're like, you know, or, or there may be a history of abuse where you're not going to return the cat. But the vast majority of people may be unhappy about it, but they're not going to become violent. The Jacksonville program, when they first started, they microchipped all the cats that were being returned to field so that they could try to track what was going on out in the community. Would they start seeing a lot of DOAs with microchips from the return to field program? Would they, would animals be abandoned in other places? You know, so they wanted to track it, but after 6,000 microchips, they stopped doing it because um, they didn't find anything. They didn't see any change in any of their statistics. So at that point, they felt like, let's not spend any more money on uh, microchips. Okay. Another fear is that people will complain to local officials. And the fact is that some of them will. And the way you deal with that is by anticipating it and preparing your local policymakers. Before you launch your program, you should be talking to the council members. You should be talking to the mayor. You're not looking for their approval, but you're looking to uh, let them know. So it's not a surprise when people call and complain and educate them so they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that will help a lot with cutting back the complaint. Another fear is that cat owners won't get a chance to reclaim their pets. In a return to field program, these guys are moving in and out of the shelter as quickly as possible. So the truth is that the national reclaim average for cats who end up in shelters is only around 2%. So it's pretty abysmal. And the chance of a pet cat being reclaimed is very, very low. They actually have a much better chance of returning home if they're dropped off from wherever they were trapped originally, and then they can find their own way home. Um, So this brings us to one of the kind of hot button issues with return to field that's going on right now, and that's what about friendly cats? It's become kind of the dominant model, not not universal yet. That's why we're still doing these webinars. A lot of shelters are, are fine with returning feral cats. They start to struggle when the cat is friendly. And there are, um, interestingly, opposition to return to field programs. The main opponents are not conservationists or you know people who favor euthanasia. It's rescue groups. It's animal rescue groups 
who are opposed to the practice of putting cats who are tame or you know socialized back where they came from. And I think what's happened in the field is it's become for many policymakers, including some of the national groups, this issue of friendly cats has become too black or white an issue. So you have groups that espouse that all cats, all community cats that come in from the outdoors, whether they're friendly or feral, or as long as they're healthy, they should be returned exactly where they came from. And if you don't do that, you're stealing someone's pet and the cat was doing well and it doesn't matter what their temperament is. And then you have, in reaction to that, you have mostly rescue groups who are saying that's inhumane that you're taking these very friendly cats and you're putting them back outside instead of finding them a home, especially if you have space in your shelter. And they say no friendly cats. So it's become on one side, you've got groups saying all friendly cats should go back. And on the other side, you've got none should go back. The truth lies in the middle, I think. Not the truth, but the best policy in our experience is somewhere in the middle. So when you have a friendly cat, instead of having the program on autopilot, like they, if they meet these criteria, if they're this age and they're this health, it doesn't matter what their temperament is, you put them back. Each cat in a return to field program should be individually assessed. You can do that very quickly. It's possible in a high volume program. We've done it. And these are the things you need to think about is number one, what is the shelter's capacity for care? Do you have room for a friendly cat? If you don't and they're healthy, then it's a reasonable choice to put them back where they came from because otherwise they're going to die. What's their history? You know, we had a cat once who was friendly, but the person who brought them in was was interviewed upon intake. And then actually some of the neighbors in the area called animal control. This this cat had been in the area for years. He was the community's cat for sure. And they were angry that somebody had taken him away. So he had a great situation to go back to, had strong community ties. So when you're doing intake, you're asking things like, how long have you seen this cat in the neighborhood? Did he just show up? Have you seen him on and off for the last two years? You know, what's his health? What's, what's his behavior patterns? Um, how many other, are there other cats in the area? Things like that to assess whether this cat already has a home and you don't need to find him a new one. Um, also, keep in mind, we want to reduce the free roaming population. We don't want to increase it. So taking a cat off the streets is a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, like I said, the best approach, I think, to friendly cats is an individual assessment, taking all the factors that you know into account and don't go on autopilot. Don't say they all go back or none of them go back. Treat each cat as an individual, which is truly what they are, and you'll more often than not make the right decision. Now, kind of the nuts and bolts of a return to field program. We have a guide for you for that, published by the um, Humane Society of the United States and myself, uh, Susie Richmond, and Karen Little from Alley Cat Advocates, a TNR group in Louisville, and Danielle Bays from Humane Society of the United States are all co-authors of this. And it's a real nuts and bolts. It's what do you ask when somebody drops off one of these guys? You should have questionnaires, standard questionnaires and information that you're gathering. Um, how do you house them? How do you track them through the shelter? What's the safest or best way to return these guys? You know, how do you deal with community messaging? All of that is in this handbook. What we saw happening was as return to field programs were taking hold, there was no reference, there was no central reference material, and shelters were having to start from scratch over and over again. So we put this handbook together based on best practices at the time. So that if you're starting a program or you're looking to improve yours, you can refer to this book. Undoubtedly, you will adapt some of these things to your own circumstances, but it gives you a a good place to start. So the second half of today, we're going to talk about targeting and how you can take your return to field program and kind of raise it to the next level. So to me, there's two measures of success when you're talking about a return to field program. The first one is really obvious, which is you're lowering euthanasia. So that's almost a guarantee that you're going to accomplish that. The second measure of success is a bit more complicated, and that has to do with where are the cats coming from? And the goal should be uh, not only to reduce the shelter's euthanasia rate, but to reduce the number of cats that are out in the community, the number of cats coming into your shelter, and then the number of cats you need to return to field. So if you recall, I pointed out in this chart of Jacksonville how the number after that first full year, the number of cats being returned to field 
kept gradually decreasing as well as intake into the shelter. So ideally, you don't want to return to field program that's just always putting out the same number of cats, returning the same number of cats year after year. You want a program where every year there's fewer cats that come in and fewer cats that need to be put back out. And the way you can accomplish that is by augmenting your return to field program with what we call a targeted TNR program. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So this is our RTF cat uh, once again. And here he is. And we've fixed him. He's come into the somebody, trapped him, dropped him off at the shelter. Uh, the decision was made to fix him and put him back because he's a very healthy looking fellow. So there he is, right? He's back in his neighborhood. But what are the chances that he's the only cat in this backyard neighborhood? Pretty small, uh, especially since we know that complaint-driven trapping, which either done by animal control officers or more often by citizens, is very inefficient and rarely gets all of the cats or even most of the cats in an area. It's like somebody has a couple of traps, they put them out, whoever comes along is unfortunate enough to get caught, gets sent off to the shelter, but the bulk of the cats in the area remain. So this is really what return to field program usually looks like. So you've got Kitty coming back. Now he's fixed, but there's nine other cats in the neighborhood and they are not. So this is not going to be an effective form of population control, right? Because this one cat you returned cannot, you know, that reproductive capacity that he represents has been removed, but he's still got nine cats. Remember, we talked about carrying capacity and there's a limit to how many cats are going to be in an area. And those nine cats are going to be able to reproduce more than enough to keep the colony at its carrying capacity. So you basically, by doing this return to field of the one cat, and that's all you've done, you've saved that cat's life, which is a great thing, but you've done nothing to reduce the number of cats in the community. And if if that's one of your goals, then the way to do it is not just to return this guy and walk away, but to send in a team and trap the rest of the cats in that area. In other words, This is what is referred to as the red flag approach. So the RTF cat is your red flag. So if he comes in from a neighborhood, he's your sign that there's probably a bunch of other cats in that area. And if you want to stop having cats coming in from that area, you need to go out there and TNR the rest of them. So this would be what we call colony level targeting, where you're trying to get all the cats in the same group that the RTF cat belongs to you're trying to get them spayed and neutered. So this is the combination of return to field and colony level targeting. And as promised, we're going to go to Farrellville to have another look at this. And this is on a global scale. What if you're only doing return to field and the red circles are the cats that have been spayed and neutered through the return to field program, this is what it looks like because they come in randomly through the community. You may have a couple of cats or a few cats from one colony, one group, but generally they're scattered throughout the community. And what you can see is that there's no one colony of cats that has a high enough sterilization rate to create population decline, to make any dent. All these colonies are gonna stay at their same carrying capacity, uh, stay at the same numbers, which equals their carrying capacity. So you're saving their lives, but you're not reducing numbers. Now, if we do the colony level targeting so that wherever we return a cat to field, We send out a trapper to talk to people in the neighborhood, get whatever information they need, and then trap the rest of the cats or most of the rest of the cats in that area. Then you start to see a very different picture when it comes to population control. So it's not just the RTF cat who's fixed. It's most of the rest of the colony. And now you've made a significant dent in these particular groups being a source of future cats coming into your shelter. So again, let's play it out. So you would return to field. This is the first cat who was impounded, who was dropped off at the shelter and is being returned. And as we talked about before with the grocery store, well, you know, there's still plenty of cats there who will reproduce and use up the food that's available. So if you're doing RTF, you're not just dropping that cat off, you're going and you're fixing the rest of them. And then gradually over time, you're going to experience some population decline. And you notice these guys are all ear-tipped. So this is, this is colony-level targeting, but colony-level targeting and return to field is not necessarily the most efficient way to go when you're talking about population control. So this is what it looks like at first. 
you return to field that one kitty, you've TNR'd the rest of them. We're talking a few years later, you're down to five cats. But there's a risk to this situation. And what do people think it is? There's a risk in terms of population control and numbers. More join. And why would that be? Why would more cats be joining the vacuum effect? You've got your five cats, but you still have enough food for 10. And remember, this colony is surrounded by other colonies. And now you have a partial vacuum. And sooner or later, some of these other colonies are going to start creeping in, right? Like here. And the cats that are there, you know, you hear about TNR, how one of the advantages is that the colony cats, once they're fixed, they will keep other cats out of the territory. That's only true if there's only enough food for the cats that are in the territory. If there's more than enough food, they don't really have any incentive to keep anybody out. So you end up with backsliding. You probably won't go back all the way if you stay on top of it a little bit, but you will have some more cats coming in because of the population pressure from surrounding colonies. So how would you solve that problem and not backslide? You don't stop there. You TNR all the colonies in that area. You don't just target the store, you target the entire neighborhood. And if you've got all the colonies TNR'd, there are no community cats to migrate into partial vacuums. And those five cats will stay five cats because the other colonies are not under pressure. They're not looking for new food sources. And this is what we call community level targeting as opposed to just looking at one colony at a time. And when you combine that with return to field, like we've been talking about, and we go back to Perilville, this is what that would look like. You would RTF the red cats, wherever they came from, they get fixed and they go back. But it, instead of using the red flag approach, which is to follow up with each colony that an RTF comes back from, you look at your data, you say, what's a real high intake part of our community? And let's spend all our TNR resources there and not do colony level targeting. Let's do community level targeting. So you look at your data, you realize that zip code number three is the neighborhood where most of the free roaming cats are located. So you go in and you TNR all the colonies you can, whether they are connected to an RTF cat or not. So you have two things going on at the same time. You have RTF cats going back out, but you also have your high intake areas being targeted for spay neuter. So this would be RTF combined with community level targeting. Cats of the Wild is the podcast for cat lovers who want to make a difference. Listen to inspiring and engaging stories of wild cat conservation and learning how you can help protect cats all over the world. Search for Cats of the Wild in your favorite podcast app now. Do you want to make things easier on yourself and the others in your organization? Our friends at Dubert have teamed up with the Dallas Pets Alive and Spay Neuter Network teams, and together they have created the Companion Case Management Module. It allows you to be more proactive with all your organization's needs, create cases for your clients, and organize them by type. Whether it is a rehoming situation, a pet parent needing food or medical assistance, or simply spay and neuter inquiries, CCM can help you manage all of them right from the Dubert system. Plus, a huge bonus, it allows you to connect with those clients right from the case So there is no need to open up new windows for emails or pull out your phone for text messages. Check it out and learn more at www.dubert.com to get started today. Ever wanted to quickly connect, collaborate, or problem solve with others in the animal welfare field who are, you know, real people? Look no further than Maddie's Pet Forum. Maddie's Pet Forum brings people of animal welfare together with the common goal to keep more people and pets together. We share ideas, expertise, offer each other support, resources, and more. Visit forum.maddiespetforum.org slash cats. Maddie's Pet Forum. Come for an answer. Stay for the community. So I want to give you some real life examples of this so you don't think it's all just kind of theory. Albuquerque was a great, is a great example because they kind of went through a number of phases. They launched a return to just a pure return to field program. You know, cats coming into shelter, they go back out. That was the extent of the program. That started in 2011. Now, the next year in 2012, they added colony level targeting. So every time they sent out a return to field cat, they had a trapper follow up in that particular location. 
Sometimes they would catch two or three more cats. Sometimes they would catch 19 or 20. It just depended on what the situation was where the RTF came back from. And this was launched with support from Best Friends as well as uh, PetSmart Charities. Then, in addition, there was a community-level targeting program added onto this as well, where uh, seven zip codes in the Albuquerque metro area were targeted just for intensive TNR, independent of whether return to field cats were going into those areas or not. The colony level targeting and return to field was part of the sort of the Albuquerque Animal Welfare Department. And the community level targeting was done by a large private shelter in the area. And that started in July of 2010. So you had all these things going on. You have return to field, you have follow up colony level targeting. Simultaneously, you have high intake zip codes being targeted independent of the municipal shelter. So this is what it looks like statistically. So 2010 is your baseline year when there was nothing going on. And you could see intake was close to 10,000. Euthanasia was a a little over 5,000. So just return to field was introduced in 2011. And you can see how euthanasia dropped from 2010 to 2011 by about or a little bit more than the number of return to field cats. You can also see that intake didn't change. It pretty much stayed level, just euthanasia changed. Then in 2012, the red flag approach, the colony level targeting. So every time they sent the return to field cat out, they followed up with trapping at that location. And you can see the number of return to field cats increased and euthanasia continued to drop, but you also start to see intake dropping. So you're not just getting euthanasia gains you're getting intake gains as well. And then as you progress through the next few years, you can see how euthanasia kept going down to about as low as it's going to go, like 85% by 2016 compared to 2010. But you see the beauty of that intake every year going lower and lower and lower. And that's because of the colony level targeting and the community level targeting that was going on so that the source of return to field cats was being addressed at the same time return to field was going on. So there were fewer cats coming in, fewer cats needing to be returned. So this is that second level of success that can be achieved when you combine return to field with targeting. This similar program was done in uh, not just Albuquerque, but five other communities. Well, it's been done in a number of places, but it was, um, you see the first six that were done here. And this is from a study that you can get online from Daniel Spearer and Peter Wolf of uh, Best Friends, where they did a data analysis of the six shelters that participated in what we call the community cat program. So that's when you integrate return to field and targeted TNR. And you can see on average in the left column highlighted in yellow, your average intake is down 32%, kittens 40%, and the average euthanasia down 83%. So really dramatic drops in euthanasia across the board. You can see in Tucson it went down 91%, but pretty significant drops for most, except for San Antonio, which went down 1%. And there was a reason for that. You still see on average one third lower cat intake. So not just doing return to field, but combining it with targeting can get you lower intake. And in San Antonio, what happened was when they launched the return to field program, all of a sudden people started feeling like, oh, the shelter is a safe place for cats now. And that first year of the program, they had a surge in kittens being dropped off. After that first year, if you look at the charts, you'll see that intake kept decreasing. So it was just that kind of first year phenomenon that can happen when there's suppressed demand and people, all of a sudden, their perception of the shelter changes. How do you identify these high need areas if you're going to do community level targeting? There's a few uh, different ways to do this. One is you can GIS map. If you look at intake, you're gathering the addresses, hopefully when people bring in cats, where the addresses of where they came from, and you can just put them on a map and through uh, Google or some other program and get a visual of where the cats are coming from. That will help you identify where to target. You can also map complaint calls, or if you're not a shelter, you can track requests for assistance. Any data that comes in from a location, you want to get that address and then map it. And then finally, there's what I call tribal knowledge, which is just if you talk to people in the field who are experienced and have been working in that community for some time, they're going to know where there are concentrations of community cats. Another tell is the income level. 
the economic level of the community because there's a strong correlation between Stacy was mentioning this in, in another area, but between you know social vulnerability, I believe it's a term, or low income, and the presence of community cats. And the, there was a really interesting study that you see here done by Dr. Gary Petronic in Boston to correlate this. And what you see is, let's see, this is this is income level, and um, the darker the red and orange, the lower the average income in that area, right? And then on the right, what you see is cat intake from that same community and the dark red is the high intake areas. And you can see how the dark orange on the right-hand chart, which is cat intake, correlates almost exactly to the poorest areas, the lowest income areas on the chart. So that's a good clue if you're looking for where to target and where the most community cats are is socioeconomic indications. So how to combine the kind of the nuts and bolts, that, that's a little taste of the nuts and bolts, that, that discussion about um, income levels and cat intake. PetSmart Charities has published a book that I authored called Community and Art Tactics and Tools. And this goes into uh, return to field and combining it with targeting and how to do targeting in a lot of detail. So if you're looking for the nuts and bolts on that, if you want a print copy, I think they're still selling them on Amazon, but it's one of the handouts today. So go ahead and download that book and you'll be able to go into the nuts and bolts of this in a lot more detail. Super, Brian. I have lots of questions. So let's do a little acronym dance, Brian. We have Return to Field. We have TNR. We have TNRM. We have TNVR. And, you know, some folks are not 100% clear what the differences are between all of them. You know, you went into pretty good detail about return to field versus TNR, but you know, how do those other acronyms fill in? And just again, to repeat, return to field and TNR, what are the differences between those? Well, TNR is trap, neuter, return, sometimes referred to as trap, neuter, release, but return is a better term because it indicates the cat's going back to where he or she came from and not just being random released. So we prefer trap near to return. Some programs like to emphasize other parts of the program as well. So TNRM, the M stands for manage or monitor. And that implies that part of the program is after the cats have been returned, there's a caretaker who's feeding them, uh, watching over them, basically managing that colony. Uh, the TNVR is some organizations like to emphasize the rabies vaccination. So the V is for vaccinate. Personally, I like to just say TNR. And the, the reason for that is if you try to stick whatever part of it you want to emphasize into the name, you can end up with a very, very long acronym. <laughs> so for example, back in about the mid 2000s, it got really silly. It became like T-T-A-V-R-N-M for trap, test, which fortunately we don't do anymore, uh, adopt, rescue, manage, monitor, and it just became un totally unwieldy. So, you know, it's trapped near to return. It encompasses a, a number of other things besides just those three steps. But basically, if you see TNR and some other letters stuck onto it, it's TNR, just whatever program likes to emphasize some other part of it. Now, going back to the difference between TNR and return to field, as I say, it's confusing because the return to field program involves trapping a cat, right? It involves uh, getting the cat neutered and it, it involves returning the cat. So isn't that TNR? How's that any different, right? Since it's trap, neuter, return. And that's where it's important to understand the differences in the overall intent and approach. So in a return to field situation, the person who's doing the trapping is not intending to get the cat fixed and have the cat returned. In most cases, in most cases, that's a citizen who wants the cat gone for good. And they don't much care what happens to the cat after they drop the cat off at the shelter. In a typical TNR situation, the trappers do care what happens to the cat. They want the cat to come back. They just don't want him to reproduce. So the intent with which the trapping occurs is very, very different. Another significant difference is that in a typical TNR project, the cats are going straight to the spay-neuter clinic, and then they're recovered and they're returned. With a return-to-field situation, the first stop for the cat is usually an open admission shelter. 
and then the cat goes to a spay neuter clinic if the shelter decides that the cat's being returned. So that's a big difference. And then that points to yet another difference, which is who's deciding what happens to the cat. In a TNR situation, when Susie and I go out, we help a caretaker do a TNR project. The caretaker's deciding, I want the cat back. In a return to field situation, it's the shelter that decides what happens to the cat, not the person who trapped him or her. So those are those are the differences. Maybe another way of saying it is that in return to field, if the cat was not spayed and neutered and returned, the cat would be euthanized. In a TNR situation, that doesn't happen. The worst that would happen is the cat would never be trapped. So those are the distinctions. I, I hope that makes it a little clearer. So the other question that we have had out there in terms of like, you know, how do you get enough trappers out there to be able to handle trapping all of these cats in the community? And and my sort of taking it to the next level question, you know, we have a lot of folks that do what I call the neighborhood cats model, which is, you know, they're individuals. They're just trying to trap a couple of cats in their backyard, trying to get them spayed and neutered. They're going to take them to a clinic. They're going to bring them back. They really don't touch the sheltering environment at all. And then there is this community cat management program component from within the shelter. Are we working in an environment where this is a combined effort or in an ideal world? Are we working as individuals and the sheltering world's not involved? How do you envision that? And your most efficient program, and that becomes more and more important these days as the accessibility to affordable spay neuter shrinks. So what we have has to be used the most efficiently if we're going to have the most impact. So a community-wide program where the different parts of the system are coordinating with each other is going to be a lot more effective than a program where all the different players are just operating on their own and maybe they cross paths in certain ways, but they're not coordinating their efforts. They're not, there's no central plan. So with a community cat program where you're combining return to field with targeting, either on the colony level or you're identifying high need areas in the community, that can be accomplished in a couple of ways in terms of who does the trapping. So those six programs that I showed you the statistics for, they had two employees. One was in charge of the program and one was dedicated to trapping. And that second employee was just going out there and doing TNR. So you can integrate the targeting into the shelters program by hiring that second staff person. Another way I've seen it done is that the shelter partners with local nonprofits who do TNR, and the shelter will handle a lot of the spay neuter, especially for the return to field cats, and then alert the nonprofit like, hey, we're returning, you know, sometimes the nonprofit will actually do the driving. And then the nonprofit goes and their trappers follow up on that colony or start to work in that high need area. So if you can combine in that way, you're going to get those overall community benefits. I think that TNR evolved in this country as a very, uh, very much a grassroots thing with individuals. So people are very much used to just kind of whoever calls me, that's who I help and operating in their own little circles, which usually quickly become pretty overwhelming in terms of demand. And it's not the norm to coordinate and to work with other, especially larger partners in the community. But that's kind of to our detriment now. And um, I know in New York City with Neighborhood Cats, we're, we're running a grant program now that's supported by the Community Cats podcast to encourage groups to start targeting, to stop thinking one colony at a time, but start to think a neighborhood at a time. So don't just go into somebody's backyard and fix their six cats, do the whole block. And that can grow from there into doing the whole downtown area or doing the whole zip code or things like that. But we don't have to go backwards now because we're losing spay neuter if we become more effective and more efficient in our methods. But that kind of depends on everybody in the community. First of all, knowing that this is a more efficient and effective way to go and then being willing to go to the shelter and instead of just taking in random calls and working there, go to the shelter and say, where would you like us to trap? You know, where are you getting the most cats coming in from? We're going to put our resources into that neighborhood and not just scatter ourselves all over town. It's a tough paradigm shift, um, but, you know, keep plugging away, trying to convince people that, <laughs> that it's a better way to go. So uh, what are your thoughts um, about microchipping all your TNR kitties for ID purposes? 
Is there a stronger desire to do that? It's a lot more accessible than it used to be because microchips have gotten so much cheaper. You know, it used to be twenty dollars a chip, and now it's you know you can get them for just a few dollars. So I think it depends on the conditions. It, it's a great thing in a system that can support microchips. So everybody's got microchip readers. Everybody knows to scan. The chips are all compatible. There's a central database people can easily refer to. People are encouraged to keep the information on the chip updated. If you've got all that going on, and having microchips can be a huge help. Because sometimes, I, I know at, at the Maui Humane Society, they chip all the cats. And sometimes a cat that came in from one location is picked up on the other side of the island. And we were able to contact the original caretaker um, or just lost pet cats who end up in colonies and or just like that idea of tracking, well, what's happening? Are, are we worried about abuse? Are we seeing more of it? More information makes for better, more effective programs. But that coordinated system needs to be in place. So if everybody isn't scanning, if the chips aren't compatible, if there isn't a way to share this information quickly, then it's just a piece of metal in a cat's back that's not doing any good. So, Do you have any other tips, Brian, on sort of how to connect with trappers, how to train more trappers, bring in more? You've been doing this for so long in New York City. I mean, how do you get more folks introduced into the concept of trapping? Well, your idea about Facebook is an excellent one because they're usually a strong online community of local trappers in, in your area. So in New York City, there's there's a couple of Facebook groups in different parts of Brooklyn. There's one in the Bronx. There's So it's just a matter of doing a quick search. On Maui, there's a group that's over 2,000 people that uh, are working with cats. So find that online community and connect with that. If you're an organization, doesn't matter what size you are, develop an email list. You can get onto MailChimp for free, I think, for the first 2,000 names. And what we'll do at Neighborhood Cats is somebody needs help feeding or somebody needs help fostering or something like that. And email goes out to this network of a few thousand people and usually it's solved. So between online communities and nonprofits kind of taking the lead, realizing that especially as you start to work more and more on a community level, there's more to it than trapping networking people and creating those networking opportunities within your community becomes an important part of making your TNR program effective. So um, look for stuff online if you're working as an individual. So, you know, hook into that network. And if you're a nonprofit, whatever size you are, start to build that network so people have something to join. And also organizations can partner with us here at the Community Cats Podcast and Neighborhood Cats if you want to help with spreading the word out into your community, trying to encourage others to sign up for the TNR certification workshops. We send along all the digital swag that you would need along with press releases to be able to get the word out in your community and area, trying to bring in volunteers to become trappers. Many organizations require that they go through our training first as a way of pre-screening volunteers. So you're not sort of wasting your three hours in training somebody and then they go, oh my gosh, my car is going to have all these cats in them or I don't have a car or, oh, I didn't know I had to hold them overnight or they bounce around in the trap. I didn't know that was going to happen. I couldn't do that. So there are people who will go through the training and and it'll weed them out. And then there are other people who go, oh, that looks so cool. I can't wait to use the drop trap, right? So you know, we're helping with that pre-screening process with volunteers doing that first step and then You can personalize it on that next step of getting to know your organization. But we're here to partner to try and help with the basic 101 training of a beginning trapper. And we're happy to partner with your organization and and help with sharing. One other uh, resource that I found very helpful, too, is all the lost and found Facebook groups that are out there utilizing trapper training. And even in these free webinars is just going into those groups and sharing the links to these free webinars that we provide. So that folks in those groups can learn about how to trap cats in the community, because with lost and found cats, if you've lost a cat, you're going to be setting traps out there. And oftentimes you're going to trap other people's cats, too. So you're having to learn how to use this equipment and learning out more about your community in the whole lost and found component. And we do have Kim Freeman out there in our audience today, and she's the lost cat finder. And she's got some great resources there with regards to lost and found cats, too. Yeah, that's great. And I agree with you about, uh, you know, the certification workshop started because there were spay neuter clinics in New York City that were opening up for trappers. And then somebody would reserve 20 spots and they'd show up with nine cats. 
So the clinic started to require that people take the certification workshop, which we were doing in person then, and now is online. And they found that the success rate dramatically increased. So they might show up with 17 cats or 18 cats, but not with nine. So you could not book appointments at the clinic unless you could show that you were certified. So that's a big advantage to the online workshop that is um, offered through us and Community Cats Podcast. Um, it just makes sure everybody's on the same page and has basic knowledge of the work because it's, well, if you try it, it's not as easy as just buy a trap, put some bait in the back and stick it outside. There's quite a bit more to it. <laughs> That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Wow.